السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد So today we continue with uh, the explanation of Al-Adab Al-Mufrad of Imam Al-Bukhari related to the prophetic morals, the manners and the etiquettes and the behavior and the conduct of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that which the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum that they learned from him. The hadith today is a hadith, num is hadith number 103. And it comes under the chapter of the rights of the neighbor. So Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he said that Ahmed bin Humaid narrated to us. And he said that Muhammad bin Fudail narrated to us from Muhammad bin Sa'ad who said that I heard Abu Dhabiya Al Kala'i saying that I heard Al Miqdad ibn Al Aswad radiallahu anhu saying that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked his companions about zina, about fornication. So they said, Haram Haramahullahu wa rusuluhu. It is haram. Allah and his messenger have prohibited it. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated that a man commits zina with ten women is easier upon him than him committing zina with the wife of his neighbor. So then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and he asked them about stealing. So they said Haram. It is Haram. Allah and his messenger have prohibited it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a man steals from ten houses is easier upon him than stealing from the house of his neighbor and this chain of narration it is sahih so this hadith just as the previous hadith that it is concerning or the previous two hadith it is concerning the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his instruction regarding good treatment of the neighbor and from withholding and the obligation of withholding from harming him and harming his honor, his wealth, his property and his family and from those crimes is the crime of fornication, zina. And it is not hidden from the uqala, from the wise ones and the intelligent ones, that zina is of two types. The zina which is lesser zina, which is asghar, and that which is akbar, and that which is the greater zina. So zina is of these two types. As for the zina which is 
the lesser zina, then concerning that, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated in a hadith that has been collected by Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Huraira that Allah, Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam stated that, that indeed Allah has written upon the son of Adam his portion of zina, of fornication. And he will fall into it not being able to resist. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so the zina of the eyes is to look. And the zina of the tongue is to chat. And the soul wishes and desires. And the private parts either affirm all of that or they deny it. End of the hadith. So zina, or a, a, a zina which is asghar, which is the lesser zina, then it is caused, naam, it is a cause of falling into immoral and lewd conduct, meaning that the lesser zina of looking and chatting and so on, that it will lead to intercourse, it will lead to lewd conduct, and that which is absolutely haram. So it is not allowed for a neighbor to look upon the honor of his neighbor, meaning it is not allowed for him to look at the women folk. And the ladies of the houses in his neighborhood. Because we mentioned yesterday that the neighbor is not just the door that is next to your door, but it includes your whole neighborhood. So, therefore, it is forbidden with a severe forbiddance to look at the women folk of your neighborhood or that you glance at them or that you chat with them in a manner that you know is a pathway to zina which is the the greater zina which is fornication rather it is upon him to respect his neighbors and to save himself and his nafs from falling into that which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a mighty thing and that which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam declared to be a great and mighty thing as occurs in this example mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith when he asked his companions regarding the ruling of fornication so they said it is haram Allah and his Messenger have made it haram so we say yes Allah and his Messenger have made it haram and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has built upon it and made concerning it for the one who falls into it that Allah has threatened them with a severe threat and for that person there is in this world not only in the next world but even in this world that there is for them a punishment in a Muslim country and that is a punishment that deters others within society from causing this type of corruption the corruption of fornication and the corruption of this lewd type of behavior so if the man is not married and he has not been previously married then for committing fornication upon him as a punishment is that he is lashed with a hundred lashes in front of the people and he is expelled from his land for a year 
as recompense and punishment for zina. So that is the punishment upon the one who is not married and he or she were not previously married. That they are lashed with a hundred lashes and they are expelled from their land. And that is Naam. And that is because of the fact that this person has committed an act that is forbidden for him. That he has done something that is not allowed except after marriage. He has done that which is not allowed and forbidden except after marriage. And if he was a person who was previously married or is married, so he, he already had a valid nikah, even if at the time that he committed adultery or fornication, that he was no longer married, but he was at some stage married. Then this person, he stoned with stones and rocks among a group of people. So those who are present, that they can take admonition and a lesson and the rest of the society is deterred from entering into this evil conduct that destroys houses, splits apart families, causes enmity between mankind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in there or for the one who enters into this activity a, a mighty deterrent because through these acts, lineages are destroyed such that a person does not know his own father or his brothers or his sisters because of the fact that his parents that they fornicated. And likewise, that if it is known that this is, the, uh, this is something that a wife has committed or this is something that a husband has committed with a foreign woman, then it causes nothing but enmity and hatred within families, within societies and embarrassment and humiliation upon those who have honour. So such a person when he is punished in this manner and he is stoned or whipped and lashed and the adulterer of course he is stoned so he tastes the indignity of what he has done and he also he tastes death because he is executed so this shows the great prohibition of zina and if this zina is is committed with one's neighbor then this is a even even greater crime in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore there is a, a heavier punishment that is built upon that and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clarified that in his saying that a man fornicates with 10 women is easier for him meaning it will be easier for him yawm al-qiyamah than that he should commit fornication with the wife of his neighbor because that is from the most evil of deeds that a person roams around his own neighborhood with this type of attitude of causing corruption and facade and it also of, of course without doubt it opposes the rights of the neighbor that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him as we mentioned the hadith yesterday regarding Jibreel alayhi salam and he enjoyed upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam the rights of the neighbor up until he thought that the neighbor would take a share of inheritance. So this is something that a person should be aware of. That he withholds from causing harm to others, to their families, to their daughters, to the honor of a man. Because a man has honor through his family, through his women folk. So another man should not come and violate that honor. And this occurs through its initial stages, 
and the initial stages, of course, seem slight in the eyes of the wrongdoer because he thinks to himself, I'm only looking, or I'm only chatting, or I'm only texting, or I'm only talking. So in his eyes, shaitan belittles those initial steps towards zina. So it begins with this zina al-asghar, the lesser zina. And he is not able to restrain his sight and to resist looking. So with respect to his neighbor, maybe he looks through the door or looks through the window or looks at them as they exit their homes. Then this is a share from the share or a, a portion from the portions of zina due to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that indeed Allah that he has written upon the son of Adam his portion of fornication and it does not matter Barakallahu Feekum my brothers and sisters whether your neighbor is a Muslim or a non-Muslim it does not matter whether the neighbor's wife or daughter, whether they cover or they do not cover, you have no right. And you may take your portion of the hellfire, regardless of how they dress or how they look. Because it begins with the look, with, that, with those early steps. So he falls into that, as the Prophet ﷺ said, he falls into that without being able to resist. So that is the zina of the eyes. And then there is the zina of the lisan, which is, to, which is chatting and talking. So therefore the nafs, meaning one's soul, it wishes and it desires because this is where it leads to. Desires and shahawat. And it is, a, and it is something that is mighty in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thereafter, the private parts either affirm all of that, meaning that a person goes ahead and fulfills that crime, or they deny it. But shaitan is such that he will, that he will cajole and he will, he will encourage the wrongdoer with his wrongdoing up until he falls into that stage whereby he has destroyed himself. So if it is the case that zina, in general, it is haram. In all of its various forms, whether it be major or minor zina, then with respect to the right of the neighbor, then it is even more severe in prohibition, even greater in prohibition. And it is an even greater sin. And likewise with regard to stealing, Stealing is haram, la shak. And the punishment for stealing, we know it. But stealing from one's neighbor, even if it is something small, then it is even more severe in sin. So a person who falls into that, then he is deserving of a greater punishment than the one who commits these crimes outside of his neighborhood. Why? Because your job as neighbors is to look after the neighborhood and the children of the neighborhood and the honor of the neighborhood and the honor of the neighbor. And you find many of these people who are inclined towards politics that they'll start looking at other countries and what's happening in other countries in terms of tragedies and afflictions and fitan. Yet they are the worst in terms of their conduct towards their neighbors and the women folk of their neighbors. Rectification begins in, with yourself and then your family and then your neighbors and then extending outwards your relatives and so on. So the rights of the neighbor, neighbors are huge. That you protect their honor and you treat their wives as you would like your wife to be treated. Their daughters as you would like your daughters to be treated. This is the right of the neighbor. And this excuse that some of the weak and sinful Muslims they make and they say, well, she doesn't dress properly anyway and she doesn't behave properly anyway 
and they do such and such anyway. That is not your concern to make tatabbu' and follow up the sins of others using it as an excuse to justify your sin. All of that is haram. And the fact, to, uh, na'am. Furthermore, just going back to the issue of fornication and the punishment of fornication, to prove the accusation of fornication another, against another Muslim requires four actual witnesses who will bear witness that they saw the couple performing and committing zina. Not that they saw them kissing or hugging or touching, but to bear witness against someone that they committed fornication requires that four Muslim witnesses saw the actual act of fornication. Not a recording, not a video, not a photograph, not hearsay, not whisperings, not tail carrying, but four witnesses who are trustworthy and their, and their trustworthiness is something that is attested to that they bear witness that they saw the act of fornication. If they do not produce four witnesses and yet they have accused another Muslim of fornication then this is considered to be qadf. It's considered to be qadf. Slander. And therefore, if one Muslim slanders another Muslim, then they are lashed with 80 lashings. And if they get away with it, because they lie and they deceive, so they accuse people, and they think that they can accuse someone and walk away, as you can do in the lands that we are living in, because there is no punishment upon the one who calls another person a fornicator or an adulterer or an adulteress. So if they get away with it, then they should know that the punishment of Allah and its threat awaits them Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Allah has mentioned this in Surah An-Nur, ayah number four, and those who accuse chaste women or men of zina, of fornicating, and they do not produce four witnesses, then lash them with 80 lashes, and thereafter do not ever accept their testimony and they are the fasiqoon, they are the sinners. So this is the prescribed punishment for qadf. And because the bar is set so high and it is so strict, so that the honor of people is protected, so a person cannot just on a whim accuse others of fornication. That Allah protects their honor. And the ruling of accusing someone is very, very narrow. It must be proven through eyewitnesses who saw the act. Not that Fulan and Fulan entered a home, or Fulan and Fulan entered a hotel, or Fulan and Fulan were holding hands, or Fulan and Fulan were hugging each other. That is not enough. And it is, and it is for this reason that if one looks throughout Islamic history and in Muslim societies, those who have been punished for slander then they outweigh and outnumber those who have been punished for zina by far so when the people say that the punishments of islam that they are severe yes they are severe for adultery and fornication and right, rightly so because it is a safeguarding and protection for society and it is also something that is established in the torah in the books before the revelation of the Quran it is not something that is just Quranic rather it is something that is also in the Torah and other than that so therefore the, the a person in a Muslim society who accuses another then he is punished for a false accusation so it is very rare that you'll find in Muslim societies historically and now that a Muslim is punished for fornication why because to find four witnesses who will step forward and say that they saw the act it is extremely rare almost unheard of in general but those who accuse and they are quick to accuse other Muslims 
then the slanderer thinks that he gets away with it because he is not punished. For some reason he wriggles his way out of the punishment. So if he thinks he's gotten away with it and it is shown that he accused a Muslim falsely, then even though he cannot be punished because maybe he lives in a society that does not establish the hudud of Islam or that he lives in a Muslim society where somehow he has lied or deceived and he has gotten away with accusing another Muslim male or female of fornication then that does not mean that the rest of the rulings of that ayah do not apply to him because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that he is to be lashed with 80 lashes and thereafter his witness is never to be accepted his testimony is not to be accepted meaning that you do not take his narrations you do not take knowledge from such a person you do not sit in his circles he is not worthy of being sat with why? because he has accused another Muslim and he has not brought four witnesses and he has not made tawbah and he has not repented and he has not come out and retracted so his witness is not accepted his reports are not accepted. His narrations are not accepted. His knowledge is not accepted. Why? Because such a person is a fasiq. In accordance to this ayah of the Quran. Because he accused someone. And he did not bring his witnesses. So even though he may not be punished. Because he has lied and deceived. But if it is clear that he accused someone. Then the rest of the ayah applies to him. And he is a fasiq. He is a fasiq because of the fact that he did not repent and he did not make apparent his repentance and he did not seek forgiveness and he did he even though he accuses people publicly of fornication of fornicating and of fulan and fulan in ahir that he is a fornicator and he does not repent then what's the ruling upon such a person? The ruling is in the Quran then a person comes along and says there's a difference of opinion you can bring a difference of opinion to the book of Allah and the sunnah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and say there's a difference of opinion difference of opinion upon what? upon slandering a Muslim and accusing him of being a fornicator and this is why barakallahu feekum the, 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 this religion of al-Islam that it protects the rights of the people that even if a person has it in his mind that fulan and that uh, this man has, has committed evil with that woman he can't accuse them of fornicating he can say that they, com they did something that is not correct maybe they held hands and he wasn't married to her maybe he kissed her and he wasn't married to her but that is not the same as saying that he is an ahir or a zani for that he is lashed 80 lashes and the one who is lashing him should not have any mercy in his arm because this is a deterrent upon society because tomorrow it could be your son and your daughter that is accused and your families that are accused and what will that do to the fabric of Islamic societies if we allow this type of behavior nevertheless this narration he highlights to us the importance of the rights of the Muslims in general the forbiddance of fornication the forbiddance of stealing from other Muslims and more so harming your neighbors with this type of wicked behavior May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us upright and upon piety with regard to these affairs wa jazakumullahu khairan for listening walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh